So does anybody have any questions about anything before we get started? No questions? Well, let's return then to our conversation about asset spaces. And so far we've defined what's called the Arrhenius definition. In the Arrhenius definition, acids dissociate proton when they are dissolved in water. A base will dissociate hydroxide when dissolved in water. taste acids and bases, they have a distinctly different flavor. Acids taste sour. Think of things like lemons, limes, uh, grapefruits. Whereas bases, on the other hand, taste bitter. some baking powder at home, go ahead and put your finger in it and just give it a taste and see what we mean when we say that it tastes bitter. Uh, probably the most popular brand is Calumet, uh, as seen in the movie The Shining back in the 80s when Steven Spielberg used it. If you watch Room 241, there's a conspiracy theory about why he used Calumet. We're not worried about that. We just want you to know that if you have baking powder, not baking soda, but baking powder, give it a taste. That is the bitter taste that we see that we expect to taste. In lab, you have been using litmus paper, and so we recognize that acids, which end in the letter D, turn litmus red. Whereas bases, which start with a B, turn litmus paper blue. We also can talk about the reactions with metals, because you've done those in lab now. If you take a metal and you drop it into an acid, it generates hydrogen. And the gas literally bubbles off of the surface of the metal, as opposed to bases, which really show no reaction with metals. And then finally, sorry we ran out of room, but we're squeezing on the top of the next board. We can also talk about reactions with carbonates. Like limestone. Carbonates is a category. They contain carbonate anion. They're also bicarbonates. Bicarbonates just have a hydrogen stuck on the carbonate anion. So HCO3, and then with that proton carrying an extra positive charge, we end up with a negative one for the bicarbonate anion. A geologist in the field always brings vinegar with them. One of the ways to tell the difference between a sandstone, which is not a carbonate, and limestone, which is a carbonate, which oftentimes is very, very familiar. If you've ever driven through um, the gorge in Tennessee, they have regions where there are both limestones as well as sandstones that are in the same area. They look very, very similar. They're about the same color. They have about the same appearance. So in the field, the geologist wants to be able to tell the difference between a sandstone and a carbonate bearing limestone. What they would do is put a few drops of the vinegar and acid onto that. 
that rock. If the rock bubbles, then the bubbles that are coming off of it are carbon dioxide, just like the bubbles that come off of the metals are hydrogen. And then they'll be able to tell whether they have limestone or sandstone. Bases, however, show no reaction. And so these are different ways that we distinguish, can distinguish between acids and bases. Now what we need to pay attention to is the fact that in addition to the Arrhenius definition, there is another definition for acids and bases. We call it the Bronson Lowry definition. Lowry definition, acids can be identified because they are proton donors. Bronson Lowry bases are identified because they act as proton acceptors. And what this definition allows us to do is it allows us to expand the types of compounds that we refer to as bases. We'll find in a minute that all our arrhenia acids are also bronze lowry acids. But no, arrhenia base is a bronze lowry base. And so the bronze lowry definition is based on proton transfer, just as redox is based on electron transfer from one place to another. But with the bronze lowry definition, it is a proton that gets transferred from one place to another, from the acid to the base. The acid is the proton donor. The base is the proton acceptor. And what we need to pay attention to is that if we have to have a donor and an acceptor in the same chemical equation, then that implies two reactants, not the one reactant that we see for the R radius definition. So, let's compare our radius acid behavior versus Bronson Lowry acid behavior. definition, if we have an acid like nitric acid, we need to be able to recognize, and should have memorized by now, that this is a strong acid. Strong acids are strong electrolytes, which means that when they dissolve in water, every single formula unit dissociates. To indicate that every single formula dissociates, we draw a single process arrow left to right. So we end up with proton and nitrate ion. In the Bronze of Lowry definition, we have to have both a proton donor and a proton acceptor. So we pull the water down off of the region above the arrow, and we now go ahead and make it an active reactant. According to Bronze and Lowry theory, your acid is the proton donor. So we're still going to have that H leaving the nitric acid formula unit. And when it does, we're going to now add something or make something called protonated water. In other words, a water molecule with an extra proton on it. This is actually in your list of polyatomic ions that you've been asked to work with ever since, uh, I don't know, term, chapter two. And so this particular ion is given a special name. We call it, call it the hydronium cation. And it doesn't exist until we get to the Bronze and Lowry definition for acids and bases. It does not exist in the Arrhenius definition. But in order to explain the Bronze and Lowry definition, we have got to have the hydronium cation form. Now, the rest of the nitric acid molecule, namely the nitrate anion, 
we're still going to end up in aqueous solution. But what I'd like for us to recognize here is that the bare proton in the Arrhenius definition and the hydronium cation in the bronson lowry definition are analogous to each other. So we need to make sure that we recognize the difference between these two definitions. But I'd also like for us to recognize that if you are an Arrhenius acid, you're also a bronson lowry acid and vice versa. If we have a weak acid, not every single formally unit ionizes. For our weak acid example, we'll go ahead and use nitrous acid. Again, both definitions. of this, basically, we have a water molecule, and then the proton comes in, it bonds to the oxygen, and so instead of just H2O, we have H3O, neutral, plus one, and so that species overall has a plus one charge. Yes, the proton becomes part of the water molecule, protonated water, hydronium. Bases are metal hydroxides. 
They're also ionic compounds. <clears throat> Therefore, they are all solids at room temperature. If we take a base like potassium hydroxide and we throw it in the water, it's a strong base, a strong electrolyte. Every single formula unit is going to ionize. And on the product side, we get an aqueous proton, I'm sorry, K plus, and an aqueous hydroxide. Now, if we follow the suggested protocol for the Bronson Lowry definition, then the water is now going to have to become a participant, a reactant. But if we say that acids are acids, then that means that bases are bases as well. And so KOH as a base should act as the proton acceptor. It's better here to go ahead and represent the water molecule as H-OH to emphasize the fact that the proton from the water molecule, which is now going to act as an acid, is going to be donated to the KOH molecule. On the product side, this gives us the chemical substance KOH2. In other words, there's still one potassium, one oxygen, but now there are two hydrogen. And we also get the hydroxide anion. There's only one problem. KOH2 does not exist. So therefore, this reaction would not occur. The bronson lowry definition does not fit for our radius basis. Let's go ahead and try a weak base one that is not a strong electrolyte, one where not every formula unit is going to ionize. Aluminum hydroxide is one of the weak bases. It's not one of the eight strong bases we've asked to memorize. It's still going to be a solid because it's still an ionic compound. And all ionic compounds are solid. If I throw it into water, however, I do not expect every formula unit to dissociate. Only some of the formula units to dissociate. But the ones that do dissociate will give us the aluminum 3 plus cation and 3 hydroxide anion. Lowry definition. In order to be a base, the aluminum hydroxide will still have to act as a proton acceptor. The see that water would act as a proton donor. And so we would add the proton to the aluminum hydroxide formula unit. Give us ALOH3, but now also with an extra proton attached. I'm sorry, I'm going to have to this over here. If this did exist, it would have a positive charge because it's picked up an extra proton. The proton carries plus one, add a plus one to a neutral substance, plus one overall charge. So the same thing would be true if aluminum OH3 H plus formed, but it doesn't. The rest of the water molecule would still be expected to be there if this reaction occurred. However, because there is no chemical species, ALOH3H, that means that the bronson lowry definition for our radius bases does not occur. And so while all Arrhenius acids are bronson lowry acids, no Arrhenius bases our bronson lowry bases. And vice versa. If it's a bronson lowry base, it will never be an Arrhenius base.
So, this begs the question, exactly what kind of chemical substance is a bronzophile base? <laughs> A bronson lowry base has got to be a proton acceptor. Now, there's a lot of information built into this. The proton carries a positive charge. Therefore, for a substance to act as a bronson lowry base, it has to be attracted to that positive charge. And of course, what's more attractive for positive charge than anything else? Negative charge. A negative charge. So, the first category of chemical substances that can act as bronze and lowry bases are anions. Any anion. Doesn't have to be the polyatomic anions that I'm going to show here, but this is where we most often pay attention to constant lowry base behavior. And so if we have a carbonate anion, and it's an aqueous solution, which means that it's surrounded by water molecules, then some of those water molecules can be convinced to donate their proton. And so the anion acts as the proton acceptor. The water is going to act as the proton donor. And on the product side, we're going to get the bicarbonate anion and the hydroxide ion. <coughs> now, this is a subtlety that really doesn't come important to chemistry 112, but all of your bronze and Lowry bases are weak bases. So anytime we work with a bronze and Lowry base, we're going to be using those two half-headed opposing arrows because the processes never go all the way through. So, any anion can act as a bronson lowry base because any anion has a negative charge that the proton would naturally be attracted to. The second type of substance that acts as a bronson lowry base is ammonia. We said from the very beginning that because ammonia doesn't have the hydrogen listed first, even though the hydrogen is the cationic portion of this particular molecule, that tells us immediately that it is not an acid. Well, it's not an Arrhenius base either, but it turns out that it is a bronze and base. And so if we take an ammonia molecule and we react it with water, then the ammonia molecule as a bronze and Lowry base, will have to act as a proton acceptor. This means that the water is going to be our proton donor. And so when we run this reaction, we end up with NH4, which you also recognize. We call this the ammonium cat. Ammonium cation is also a consequence in part of the bronze Lowry definition, but there are chemical substances that contain the ammonium cation, and so therefore the ammonium cation also fits the Arrhenius definition, but NH3 does not. And so the balance of the water molecule is there, this chemical reaction occurs, and so we have bronze Lowry acid base behavior. Specifically, ammonia is the base, water as the acid. Now there's a third category of substances that act as bronze and Lowry bases. Your book introduces them, but we don't do a lot with them here in Chemistry 111. We picked this up in 112. 
This class of compounds are called the amines. Amines are nitrogen-containing organic substances. It's been a while since we talked about this, but at the end of chapter two, we met organic substances. And in order to be organic, a substance has to contain both carbon and hydrogen, and they have to be bonded to each other. So our first example of an amine is going to be the chemical substance NH2CH3. Now, there's only one carbon in this substance. You'll remember the prefix that means we have one carbon. I heard it. No. Mono is for other uh, inorganic substances. Meth. Very good. We call this particular chemical methylamine. It's an amine because it contains nitrogen. It is a methyl because it has one carbon. Now, in order to make methylamine, what we do is we start off with ammonia, and then we run a reaction where we kick off one of the hydrogens. That now leaves us with NH2. And where the hydrogen used to be, a methyl group comes in and fills its place. And so we bring in a methyl group. So methylamine, that's the chemical formula NH2CH3. Now, because it contains nitrogen, and we'll make more sense of this for you in chapter 8, because it contains nitrogen, that means that it has some negative character that makes it attractive to a proton. Just like ammonia is attractive to a proton. And so, if we bring in a water molecule, the water is going to donate its proton to the methylamine molecule. And reversible process is established. And now we have NH3, CH3. And with this extra proton, this species carries a positive charge. The remainder of the water molecule also exists. And so this is how amines react with water. The amine is going to act as a bronze lowry base. It's going to be a proton acceptor. Water is going to be a bronze lowry acid. It's going to be a proton donor. We end up making this chemical species, NH now 3, CH3, with a positive charge. <coughs> and we call this the methyl ammonia. And that's where ammonium cations end up coming from, is from the bronze and Lowry acid base reaction. Everybody agree okay with all of this? So there are three categories of substances that act as bronze and Lowry bases. Any anion, ammonium, and <coughs> through these examples, you may have noticed that water has an unusual property. Sometimes it acts as a bronze of acid. Sometimes it acts as a bronze of base. In the world of biology, we have creatures that can live and exist both on land and in water. We call them amphibians. Prefix amp means both. And so here we're talking specifically about both modes of life. Life on land, life on water. Of course, the Greek word for life is bios. So our word amphibian comes from these animals, not the other most animals, that can live in both water and on land. Similarly, we have substances that we call amphiprotic. Amphiprotic substances make 
exhibit both modes of Bronsted Lowry acid based behavior. So these are substances that sometimes act as an acid, sometimes act as a base. What determines its behavior is the other chemical substance that it encounters. So if water runs into an acid, then it will act as a base. And if water runs into a base, then it will act as an acid. And so HNO3 plus H2O, the acid is going to donate its proton to the water. Here at the bronze of the Harvey base. However, if water encounters ammonia, then the water donates the proton. And so here water acts as a bronze diary acid. <clears throat> and so we say that water is amphiprotic. Water is an unusual compound, but it was the only substance that did this. We would need a whole category. So there are other chemical species that are also amphiprotic, namely any hydrogen containing polyatomic ion. Bicarbonate anion can go either way. It can donate its proton if it encounters another acid. I'm sorry, another base. Or it can accept the proton if it encounters another acid. So just like water, this hydrogen-containing polyatomic anion is amphiprotic. It shows both modes of bronze lowry acid based behavior. The bisulfite ion does this. The bisulfate anion does this. Phosphate anion does this. The monohydrogen phosphate anion does this. The list is not exhaustive, but it covers pretty much all the polyatomic anions that you've encountered so far that have hydrogen. And in every single case, a hydrogen can either be donated or another hydrogen can be accepted. And so this is also amphiprotic behavior. Revisit the idea of electrolyte dissociation. by that 
is that if we take a calcium hydroxide formula unit, calcium hydroxide is one of the eight strong bases, therefore it is a strong electrolyte, single process arrow left to right. We're going to get a calcium 2 plus cation and two hydroxide anion. I'm writing the hydroxides out individually because I want to emphasize to you that this particular formula unit is associates. And so if we start off with our calcium 2 plus cation with hydroxide ions on either side of it, then upon dissolution, these ionic bonds are going to break. And so all at once, we get a calcium 2 plus hydroxide and another hydroxide anion and then of course each one of these are they going to become surrounded by a sphere of hydration. The sphere of hydration prevents them from rejoining back together and it is what keeps these ions in aqueous solution. The oxygen end of the water molecule is going to be attracted to the cation. It does so all at once. Now, this is in contrast to acids. Because when acids dissociate, they only dissociate one proton at a time. recognize that this is a covalent substance, not an ionic substance. Because an ionic substance would dissociate all at once. But an acid dissociates one proton at a time. Now, if there's only one proton, that's pretty straightforward. But, if we have a diprotic acid, like H2SO4, H2SO4 is a real thick, syrupy liquid, which is part of what makes it so dangerous. Because when H2SO4 comes into contact with living tissue, any type of skin, etc., it immediately oxidizes the carbon out. And so, if you've ever seen somebody who suffered a, sul a uh, sulfuric acid burn, around the burn there's a little black ring. Inside the ring, there's nothing. I mean, the skin has been completely eaten away, and the black ring around the outside is pure carbon. So the carbon has been completely oxidized. What we really want to pay attention to right now, though, aside from the fact that you should always be very careful around sulfuric acid, is that only one proton is going to dissociate. Which means that H2SO4 will dissociate to get one proton and a bisulfate anion. Now, the bisulfate anion is also pretty acidic, but it's a weak acid. It's not one of our six strong acids. And so we show the two half-headed opposing arrows. This is when the other proton ionizes away, leaving us with a sulfate anion. So all electrolytes dissociate when they're dissolved in aqueous solution. Ionic compounds dissociate all at once. All the ionic bonds are broken at one time. But for an acid, only one proton at a time is dissociated, and so acids show slightly different behavior than bases do. I mean, acids show slightly, well, yeah, I guess the bases, but also ionic compounds in general. Right. Everybody okay with all of this? All right. So. With this, it's time for us to go back to chapter three. Now, we 
we've already talked a little bit about reaction stoichiometry. I went ahead and compiled some of that information on a handout for you. I'm going to ask you to go ahead and take one copy of the handout, pass it to the person next to you. When everybody's had one, just make sure they get the rest of the copies back after class, please. So our emphasis now in returning to chapter three is reaction stoichiometry. stoichiometric amount and a theoretical yield. Typically, when we use the wording stoichiometric amount, that connotes, implies, that we're talking about reactants. The stoichiometric amount for products is called the theoretical stoichiometric amounts or theoretical yields if we are given the amount of at least one reaction or one product. Today, however, we want to work with the idea of what we call limiting reactions. got it on your handout, but please make sure that you read it and understand what I'm saying. The limiting reactant is the reactant in a reaction process that gets used up completely first. And when that limiting reactant runs out, then the reaction stops. It doesn't matter how much of any other reactant we have. It doesn't matter how much product we need to make. If we run out of the raw ingredients, then the reaction stops. So the limiting reactant restricts the theoretical yields that will be achieved. Now, all of the other reactants, and usually for our purposes here in Gen Chem 1, it's just going to be one other reactant. We're going to have one limiting reactant and one that's not limiting. The one that is not limiting, we call the reactant an excess. Because it's going to be left over after our limiting reactant gets completely used up. And to help us with this, we're going to start off first with a non-chemical example. In high school, I was a thespian. Was anybody else out there a thespian in high school? I can't be the only one. No other thespians? One, two? Okay, good. A couple other thespians out there. Probably the coolest group of kids on campus. The guy in my high school who played Jesus and Jesus Christ Superstar went on to become the mayor of New Orleans. He did already have kind of a God complex, but that's just the way things work out. Thespians oftentimes have a need to do everything. They don't just act. They build sets. They have to find lighting. They have to do all the other responsible things. They have to make costumes. So one of the times that I was working as a thespian, we had to come up with purple lights. But we didn't have any purple filters. So we had to make purple filters. What two colors can we combine to make purple? Red and blue. So, let's set this up like it's some sort of a chemical process. Now, the stoichiometry here is one to one to one. So we scurried around, and when everything was over and done with, we found 57 red filters, but we only found 37 blue filters. How many purple filters could we make? 37. So, so, see how easy this is? All we have to do is identify what our limiting reactant is. And 
And once we identify the limiting reactant, that restricts, it, restricts our theoretical yield. Now, by default, that means that the red is what we refer to as our reactant in excess. They took a substance called calcium carbide and they found that if you react calcium carbide with water, you make a chemical substance that is very, very flammable and burns with a very bright light, even if there's just a tiny amount of it. This chemical is called acetylene. Yes, like an acetylene torch. <coughs> The other product is calcium hydroxide. Now, a couple of points of interest here. Acetylene is actually the common name. The IUPAC name for acetylene is ethyl. How many carbons are going to be present if we have ethyl? Two. Very good. So ethyne or acetylene has the chemical formula C2H2. Calcium hydroxide, so we've already used that today as an example. Water, which leaves us to now just figure out what the chemical formula is going to be for calcium carbide. The carbide anion is actually a diatomic situation with two carbon atoms stuck together. Each carbon carries a negative one charge. So the overall charge on the carbide anion is negative two. Calcium, of course, is an alkaline earth metal. The alkaline earth metals are always assigned a plus two charge. When I do the crisscross method, what I get is Ca2, C2 sub two, but that's a two to two ratio. And because calcium carbide is an ionic compound, we need the empirical formula. The empirical formula is the simplest whole number ratio, so it's one to one. And so the chemical formula for calcium carbide is CAC2. One calcium two plus cation, one diatomic carbide anion. There we have calcium carbide. Now, in order to work with stoichiometry, we have to have mole. We'll talk more about that in a second. 
In lab, we don't measure moles, we measure grams. And so we need to be able to convert from moles to grams and vice versa. And in order to do this, we need the molar masses. Well, now that we know the chemical formula for calcium carbide, calcium, 40.08, the two carbons at 12.01 apiece, weigh in at 24.02. So when I add these together, I get a molar mass of 64.1. Well, my calculator would give me 64.1. But remember, both of these numbers extend all the way to the hundredths place. And so our answer has to extend to the hundredths place. And so this would be 64.10. I'll put that above the chemical substance. Water, we've calculated two few times. Water is 18.02 grams per mole, right? And then acetylene, two carbons, 24.02, so 12.01 <coughs> times two. Two hydrogens, two times 1.008, 2.016. When I add this together, my calculator would give me 24.036. However, one of the things that your authors are pretty meticulous about is they always round off these molar masses even though there could be more places provided. So we'll follow their lead. And so, 26, yes, sure, sure, thank you. Notice this is that I wrote it the second time. So we have 26.04 grams per mole. And then finally for calcium hydroxide, Calcium is 40.08. Two <coughs> oxygens, 16 times 2, 32.00. Two hydrogens, 2.016. And so when I do this, I get 74.096. This answer is going to be reported to the hundreds place. So how would I report 74.096? 74.10. 74 74.10. 74 yes, All right. So we have our molar masses. We know the chemical reaction that's occurring. Now we need a balanced chemical equation. So let's do that. We have calcium carbide, solid, reacting with water. And I'm going to go ahead and break the water up with a hydrogen and a proton because I know that the hydrogens are going to end up being part of acetylene and I know that the hydroxide ions are going to end up being part of calcium hydroxide. So, anticipating this, I'm just going to split water right off of that. On the product side, we have acetylene, a gas that really has no smell. And then finally, we have calcium hydroxide, a strong electrolyte. So therefore, it would remain a basis solution. So, Does to construct our atoms list, we would go ahead and recognize that we have calcium, <coughs> carbon, proton, and hydroxide on both sides of the reaction arrow. Is there a question? I, I was just wondering if, when you're doing this, do you have to have the up arrow for the gas for the reaction? No, I'm oh, okay. you to calculate a molar mass separately. I could ask you to balance an equation separately. I could ask you to write a valid chemical formula separately. But when we do stoichiometry, I don't want you to get bogged down in these details. I wanted to demonstrate it for you today, but I don't want you to get bogged down in this. 
So on a test, you will typically be given a balanced chemical equation and the molar masses of all the substances in the process. So let's do that. So we have calcium carbide, 64.10. I'll write the branch mole all the way at the end. Plus two water molecules, molar mass 18.02, yields acetylene, 26.04, and calcium hydroxide. probably going to be a limiting reactant problem, so we're going to have to do some calculations. Of course, any time that we work with stoichiometry, we need to convert any amount that we have to work with into moles. And so to convert grams to moles, we need a molar mass. Two, with us having two two water molecules, would that double the 18.02? No. Okay. Because water, this question comes up all the time. The molar coefficients don't matter. Because sometimes there will be one water in a reaction, sometimes there will be seven waters in a reaction. But water always <coughs> matters. This is what we call an intensive physical problem. Always <coughs> have a molar mass of exactly 18.02 grams. Okay. Thank you. All right. So, well, do me a favor. Do this calculation when somebody gets it, shout out the number for me, and then I'll verify. 1.56 for what? That's it? Just 1.56? We've done with calculations all along. We keep every single digit that our calculator gives us. If we did have to round off this answer to the correct number of sig figs, how many sig figs would that be here? Four. 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 So, if we had to stop here, we would report 1.560 moles, but we're not stopping here. How about for water? 5.5493859562. Five point five four nine three eight nine five six seven, and that's the number of moles of water. How many sig figs do we have to stop here? Four. Also four. So five point five four nine. Okay. Now, ordinarily, that's about as much as we have to do. But now what we need to do is an extra step. We have to pick a reactant. Oh, sorry. Pick a product. Doesn't matter which one you pick. Since we live in a left to right reading world, I'm going to go ahead and pick the uh, acetylene. But you're going to pick one product, and you're going to calculate the theoretical yield 
based on both of these starting miles. Take the number of moles of water and we're going to calculate the theoretical yield for a settlement. We're going to take the number of moles of calcium carbide and we're going to calculate the theoretical yield for a settlement. So we have to calculate two theoretical yields here, one for each of the starting amounts. So what we're basically doing is we are pretending that all of one reaction gets completely used up. calcium carbide to assemble. We have 1.56004 So this is moles <coughs> from the balance chemical equation. For every one mole of calcium carbide, we expect to be able to form one mole of acetylene. And so my theoretical yield for acetylene is going to be 1.56006 We also need the theoretical yield for water turning into a 17. And so we have 5.549389567. And that'll be mold for water. And from our balanced chemical equation, for every two moles of water, we can make one mole of acetylene. So we have to cut that amount in half. When I do that, my calculator gives me 2.774697484. Everybody working on getting those same numbers. Okay. Now, the smaller theoretical yield reveals the limiting reactant because the smaller theoretical yield is going to be due to the substance that runs out first. And by definition, the substance that gets completely used up first is our limiting reactant. So, okay with that. This is a fail-safe method to figure out what your limiting reactant is. If you had 10 reactants, you would calculate a theoretical yield of one product for all 10 of those reactants. And whichever theoretical yield was the smallest, that was going to be your limit. That's going to reveal your limiting reactant. So that's our final answer then? Nope. No, we're not done. 
Okay? So we've determined what the limiting reactant is. Now we want to calculate a theoretical yield in grams for our product because we still need to be able to verify the law of mass conservation. So. Once we've identified our limiting reactant, we can recognize that every single bit of what we started with gets completely used up. So if I started off with 100 grams, I can subtract all 100 grams from that. There's nothing left over. Right. We'll come back and figure out how much water is left over in a few minutes. First, I want us to go ahead and calculate the theoretical yield for both of our products, but in grams. So the first thing we need to recognize is there's a one to one to one stoichiometry between the calcium carbide and both of the products. And so therefore, while we've calculated the number of moles of acetylene explicitly, we can recognize that the number of moles of our calcium hydroxide is going to be exactly the same. So based on the one to one to one stoichiometry and identifying the limiting reactor, we now know exactly how many moles of each product is going to be made. In order to convert that to grams, we just need the molar masses. So we take the number of moles and we multiply it times the molar mass. And so for acetylene, that's going to be 1.56006-2402 times 26.04. Theoretical yield of acetylene in grams. My calculator gives me 40.6240495. Everybody else going the same number? Okay, good. We'll confirm. Then we do the same thing, but for calcium hydroxide at 74.10. So this time my calculator gives me a weird number. Remember that in order to satisfy the law of mass conservation, the mass of the reactants must also be the mass of the product. And so what we can do here is we can add up our products. My calculator gives me 156. Point two two four six four nine grams of product. Four eight. Four nine four six four nine. One fifty six point two two four six four nine. Anybody else? What are we coming up with?
Okay. 2, 2, 4, 6, 4, 9. 2, 2, 4, 6. Yes. Now, according to the law of mass conservation, the sum of the reactants should be equal to some mass of the products. And so if I know that 100 grams of the <coughs> acetylene, I'm sorry, of the calcium carbide have reacted, how many grams of water will have reacted? 56.2246. 56. So 56.22 grams of the water reacted. Right. Mass of the reactants must equal the mass of the products. And so if we start with 100 grams and 56.22 grams reacted, And that tells us that there are 43.78 grams of H2O are reacting in excess left over. Not quite as straightforward as 37 red filters, I'm sorry, 57 red filters plus 37 blue filters. It's the same idea. Just a little more work to take. Everybody okay with everything we did? We do want to come back and calculate how much water is actually left over by using stoic geometry instead of the law of mass action. Right. But we'll do that next time. On your way out, I'd like you to pick up a handout that's also on a blue paper. Sorry about that. It compiles the information about Arrhenius versus Ronson Lowry activation. So when you drop off your calculators, please go ahead and pick up a copy of this blue handout.